brewing up over the distant hills all too soon will make its impact on the rivers of the plain. The rains which nourish life can also deal destruction and death. The fact is not easily forgotten by the farmers who've lived their lives in New Zealand's South Wairarapa district. To such men and their families, the rains with their aftermath of flood-borne devastation have been not just an occasional accident, but a regular yearly menace, curbing their efforts to produce more, eroding the hard-won gains of past years, threatening even to sweep away their livelihood. Scarcely a single winter has gone by without some flooding. Stock losses, damage to pastures and fencing, to roads and buildings, and the farmers' homes has amounted to countless thousands of dollars. Since 1945, the Wairarapa Catchment Board has been responsible for soil conservation, river control and protection against flooding. The new board quickly instituted a comprehensive scheme for recording rainfall and river levels at key points in the catchment. By the early 1950s, it was able to provide a reliable early warning system. Radio supplied the link between automatic recorders strategically located in the catchment and the board's offices in Masterton, enabling catchment board staff to monitor the river systems by remote control as frequently as prevailing weather conditions dictated. Information could then be passed to certain nominated farmers in the danger area, who in turn undertook to pass it on to their neighbours. Being a jump ahead of the oncoming waters, the Lower Valley farmers have had many an occasion to be thankful for the early warning system. Most farms in the district have at least some higher ground to which stock could be moved for safety. But flood warnings are at best a defensive measure. What was needed was control. Yet the problem was massive. The Wairarapa region forms part of the southern tip of New Zealand's North Island. The main Wairarapa Valley is bounded on both sides by steep hills. To the west, the Tararua and Rimataka Ranges. To the east, the Harangi and Mangaraki Ranges. This broad central valley, stretching all the way to Palliser Bay, is a rich alluvial plain extending over an area of 110 square miles. The major portion of this fertile plain lies in the lower valley, and over much of its area is very few feet above sea level. Two further factors contributed to the flood risk. The Ruamahanga River flowed into and out of Lake Wairarapa, which in effect acted as an inefficient reservoir. From there, it emptied into the shallow Lake Onoki. This lake is separated from the sea only by a sandbar, through which a channel must remain open. Nevertheless, the major cause of flooding was the river itself, the Ruamahanga. In the past, it had regularly overflowed its banks within hours after heavy rains, inundating as much as 40,000 acres of land. Over the years, various schemes had been considered but put aside. Then, in the early 1960s, the Wairarapa Catchment Board put forward a bold plan incorporating the best of previous schemes, a plan to contain most potential floods in the river channel and provide controlled overflow and storage during occasional very heavy precipitations. Phase one included widening and clearing the lower reaches. A three mile diversion channel bypassing Lake Wairarapa. Further channel improvement up to the 10 mile mark. And an upland cutoff diverting a number of minor tributaries. Phase two, floodgates across the outlet from Lake Wairarapa preventing backflow. and an overland floodway to take excess water in times of major flood direct to the lake for storage. Phase three, reclamation of parts of the lake bed as shown and also adjacent swampland to provide 13,000 acres of new farmland and essential works in the tributary rivers and hill catchments. The importance of careful planning was underlined by the scheme's estimated cost, $5 million, subsidized by the Soil Conservation and Rivers Control Council. This was New Zealand's biggest flood control project, not to be completed until 10 years after survey parties had put the first pegs in place. Nevertheless, 
Estimates had also shown that the cost would be fully covered in five to six years after completion by the increased agricultural production it would allow. The dredged material was utilized to build up low-lying and swampy land in adjacent disposal areas, later to be developed by the Lands and Survey Department for farming. As the major works progressed, it was necessary to deal with the tributary rivers, like the Tawanui. The Tawanui, Tuanganui and other catchments were prone to massive slips which supplied unwelcome shingle to the main river system. Most of this country has now been retired from grazing and systematically planted out with pines or treated with other conservation measures. The stream training was supplemented by extensive tree plantings alongside. Adjoining the previous winter's plantings, willows were again used because of their known ability to establish themselves in the shingle. However, in the winter of 1967, poplar stakes were introduced as well. In contrast to the willows, these could be expected to have an economic value at maturity. Contractors and the engineers of the Wairarapa Catchment Board could look back on over two years of steady progress. The dredge was working particularly well. The path of the new diversion lay through the Puafa Flats, low-lying land with numerous lagoons, into which several minor rivers discharged. To give relief to the area, the scheme provided for a water cutoff. Slicing across country, upland of the lagoon region, the cutoff channel would effectively gather in a sizable portion of runoff from the eastern catchments. The design allowed for carrying even maximum foreseeable peak flows from the rivers concerned. The outfall of this upland water cutoff was direct into the main diversion. The triangle of land between the cutoff and the diversion, including the Poafa and Rangatea lagoons, was thus free of flood risk from the hill catchments. This pump station, linked to a network of new drains, was to be a key factor in lowering the water table throughout the Poafa Flats area. The pump unit, installed in December 1967, was the biggest of several placed at strategic points in the lower valley. This unit would lift drainage water into the cutoff adjacent. In this way, production capacity could be substantially increased on several hundred acres of previously marginal or outright swampland. The lagoons themselves had by now been filled with spoil from the dredging operations. Notice the raw looking areas to the left. This is the upstream end of the diversion just after completion. At this stage, October 1967, the main river flow still followed its old course into Lake Wairarapa. The swampy nature of this type of country often prevents access by heavy machinery. In this case, there was only one practical alternative. The board's chief engineer, Mr. Peter Marney, was on hand, together with Mr. Hans van der Waal, project manager for the contractors, and Mr. Harold Parsons for the subcontractors. Although supervised locally by the Wairarapa Catchment Board, the scheme's progress was a source of satisfaction too to the Soil Conservation and Rivers Control Council, the national agency through which the government subsidy was being channeled. The ever-present W90 was among the machines engaged in building the block, using some 30,000 cubic yards of fill, previously stockpiled. Men and machines would work through the night and through the following day and night before the old Rua Mahanga channel was finally sealed off. For the engineers and contractors, this was the climax of a difficult operation. With the channel block in place, the lower reaches of the river were now under better control than ever before. Two weeks later, on the 6th of March 1968, the completion of phase one was marked officially. Chairman of the Wairarapa Catchment Board, Mr. G.H. Blundell, welcomed the official party and the many residents of the district who attended. 
The Honourable P.B. Allen, MP, Minister of Works in the ruling national government, spoke of the scheme's contribution to the country's development and unveiled a commemorative plaque. At times, the world must have seemed upside down for those in the path of progress. But the Lower Wairarapa Upper Valley Development Scheme was proving itself already, and still greater protection would be afforded as it advanced through Phase 2. Yeah.